Lecture 1, the City as Cosmos. In the context of global population change, uh, thankfully leveling off uh, at some point later in the century at around 10 billion people, uh, we shift our focus to the impacts of those 10 billion people and realize that the impact will depend a great deal upon uh, whether or not <clears throat> uh, those 10 billion people live like uh, Americans in the 20th century or like Indians. Um, we can either, we will either need five planets if 10 billion people live like Americans in the 20th century, or we can uh, do fine with a population of uh, three times that, of 30 billion if we all live like Indians. Uh, and somewhere between those two extremes lies a place where 10 billion people can actually live and thrive uh, on this little planet. Uh, it turns out the biggest factor is uh, has a lot to do with how our cities work. And we looked at uh, this project that uh, started uh, from a careful analysis of the larger situation of the Valley of Caracas, set in the context of the nation of Venezuela, uh, at the current time in the conditions of uh, a global situation of uh, economic political forces and the ecologies uh, that uh, all interact with each other. Uh, and it turns out that through that analysis, you can pinpoint certain places where an architectural intervention can actually have a game-changing role, uh, serve as a vehicle for transformation that can really make a difference. Um, but it does take a careful understanding of the larger context to locate uh, the architectural intervention and to really make sure <clears throat> that the criteria of design are set up for success. So it turns out it's useful to understand the larger context of the city. In many ways, uh, what we do in this class is uh, dependent upon uh, a lot that has gone on before. And one of the most important contributions of the last century uh, comes from a man by the name of Kevin Lynch. He was teaching at MIT in the 60s. Uh, he taught a course uh, about how cities work. Uh, this course is a direct descendant of that course. Uh, he turned over his course to Julian Beinart, who was my teacher at MIT, along with hundreds of other people. And now some version of this course is taught all over the world. Uh, and one of the most important contributions Kevin Lynch made uh, to people who have or have not had any direct connection with the course he taught is a book called The Image of the City, published in 1961. The basic research method was he uh, interviewed people, figured out, uh, and asked them to draw maps of their where they live. Uh, and one of the places he did this was in the city of Boston. So conveniently for us, since we are also in the city of Boston, uh, we have these drawings that are basically the summary of those elements that people seem to recall and be able to identify. And when they drew their maps, these are the things that uh, populated those maps. And based on this research, uh, Kevin Lynch and his team identified five types of elements that people find memorable and uh, that tend to uh, structure the way they think of cities, the way they behave, the way they operate, the way they move, uh, and how cities manifest in daily life uh, for the largest number of people. Those five elements Whenever I list something like this, it's always tempting to put it on a multiple choice exam, um, just in case you were wondering. Uh, the five elements are shown here at the bottom, path, edge, node, district, and landmark.
but it's important to remember that these elements are more diagrammatic than experiential. In order to get beyond this larger spatial mental structure uh, of the five elements, path, edge, node, district, landmark, it's important to enter the world of architectural experience. And in order to work with uh, architectural experience, we need to find some way of capturing it analytically in a drawing. And uh, so that's uh, a very uh, big focus of the work of architects and this course. Here we see uh, a blow up of the diagrammatic representation of the key uh, elements, uh, the five elements, uh, as manifested in the familiar territory of Boston. It's quite useful that uh, Lynch's research was local, and so we have our own experiences and memories and recollections and our own operations of mental structure uh, to compare this diagram to, uh, which is uh, gives us an advantage in understanding these issues. Uh, the other advantage we have is that Weldon Priest teaches right here at Wentworth Institute of Technology in the last, uh, well, until recently, spent 15 years working with students uh, in the urban studio on developing techniques of architectural representations of cities. And in this uh, sample right here, you see a dozen drawings using different techniques that very effectively, more effectively, arguably, than, than anybody else has ever done before, uh, capture the architectural character of urban spatial experience by drawing cities as architecture. And so this is a very powerful reference point that we have locally in-house uh, with which to work. Uh, here we see a section and plan view of this fragment of Copenhagen uh, that shows uh, how cities can be analyzed as architecture quite effectively. The advantage that Weldon uh, had, and I was uh, lucky to work with him on this for two years, uh, was that it was in the context of a studio with uh, endless hours available to the students to devote to painstaking, careful uh, pa uh, pencil and paper drawings, um, very, uh, you know, hundreds of hours going into drawings like this. Uh, we don't have that in this course, so we are uh, asking the question, what then can we do? What if we didn't have access to hundreds of hours? What if instead we had access to new com computational tools and the internet. Uh, and so we look at, we take advantage of the new ubiquity of uh, remote sensing, satellite views, aerial views, high resolution photographs from tourists and professionals all over the world. Uh, so via the internet, we have access to all kinds of, uh, of photographic evidence that we previously did not, could only get through books which is not to say that books have gone away. Books, in many cases, are still the best sources of this type of information because print media are so high resolution in comparison with uh, most internet media. So your internet searches should uh, very narrowly only search for high resolution images. Uh, the other thing we have is we have uh, computers. And through computers, we can transform uh, aerial photographs uh, into... Uh, analytical drawings uh, quite easily and quickly. Um, but drawings such as this uh, fail to capture more fully the, the larger spectrum of, of sensual experience of architecture. And so uh, we um, use the tools of Adobe Creative Suite, of overlays, uh, mostly in Photoshop, uh, and uh, to manipulate photographs to develop better understandings. Sometimes we do it based on aerial photography uh, in a plan view, but um, the plan view actually deprives us to a large extent of a higher fidelity 
sense of three-dimensional space. We can project into this. We know that these are, are uh, two-story houses somehow, uh, that the school is not a skyscraper. Uh, the trees, though, leave shadows, and our brain interprets that uh, in three dimensions. But um, there seems to be something about the oblique aerial view that uh, does a better job at capturing the larger spatial architectural experience of these uh, places, uh, especially when we get into complex urban settings where it starts to matter a great deal. Uh, I show these not because they are the best examples. Uh, they are just a random sampling of some of the examples of work uh, produced in this mode, uh, just to give you a sense of what type of tools uh, are useful. Um, and we will review separately on Tuesday some of the tricks and techniques uh, of performing these analytical tasks. Uh, the next topic we need to look at uh, is uh, the relationship between form and meaning. Um, the larger topic of this, the larger title of the introductory lecture, uh, of which I'm coming to the end, uh, and moving quickly on to the topic of the first week, I hope, uh, is how cities mean, which is also the top. Uh, I'm thinking about that as a title for a book I'm working on. Um, and what we know about how cities mean is closely related to uh, Nelson Goodman's contribution uh, in the uh, 70s, I believe it was, uh, a piece he titled How Buildings Mean. And in that, he used the Lincoln Memorial uh, as a, a sample, as an example of the four ways he's identified as uh, how buildings generate and sustain meaning. And the first way, and again, here's a list of four things um, for those of you interested, uh, concerned about uh, exams. Uh, this is a great one because I'm gonna, about to give you four things. Um, the first one is um, explication. So the you know the Lincoln Memorial means what it means because there it is. It's written on the wall. There's actual verbal language embedded in the surface of the building that tells you explicitly uh, what the meaning is. And so here we go. The next one is uh, what we do more than anything else in Architecture Studio, thank goodness, um, because it's not always been that way, and I referred to it in class. The second thing we do is exemplification. We exemplify meaning. We offer it as a visceral, physical, experiential uh, uh, set of meanings that uh, we convey through architectural experience itself. So we approach the uh, Lincoln Memorial and we say, wow, that's big, or wow, that is seems very important, or wow, look at the materiality. Uh, but we say, wow, followed by some articulation of the experience. It's the wow part that obsesses uh, us uh, to no end in the design process. How do you create a powerful visceral response to architectural experience? It happens at the scale of the building. It happens at the scale of the urban setting. Wow, this guy is larger than life. Wow, he must have been a god. Look at how the entire city is organized to uh, arrange these axial views from a mile away. Wow, uh, this uh, is one of the larger structures that organizes uh, the society of these people. Uh, I just arrived from uh, out of town or off planet, and but I already know without anyone telling me that this guy on the chair is important. Third way, metaphor. We talked about this as well. It used to be a, a bigger deal than it is now, thank goodness. Um, this is the realm of given knowledge. You go to school and teachers tell you that Greece uh, was the birthplace of democracy and modern civil society. 
whether that's true or not, that's the given knowledge. It's not available for discovery on your own. Uh, you are taught it and you take, uh, take our words for it. Uh, but this is given knowledge. It's not something you know because you experienced it and validated it for yourself. You know that uh, this is true because it is part of the conventional understanding uh, replicated through formal schooling systems and history books and stuff like that. And so uh, the Greek column uh, here, the Ionic order, uh, is embedded with all kinds of cultural meanings that have been reinforced over the centuries. Uh, whether or not uh, it uh, remains true to the original meaning uh, that the Greeks understood. Uh, for example, uh, we now know that Greek temples were not white. They were very colorfully painted. You may have heard about this in your history class. Um, but uh, the cultural manipulations over the centuries have held so that it's more important to remain true to the story we tell, uh, to be consistent within the mythology that we have constructed ourselves, rather than staying true to the actual reality for the Greeks back in the day. Um, and so the metaphor, we deploy these symbols uh, metaphorically to allude to democracy and the power of uh, our governmental organizations. And then finally, and this one in a way is the most interesting and controversial, buildings mean what they mean because of what happens there, the events that happen there and the rituals that follow. So uh, you are just as likely to say, wow, uh, this is uh, an impressive monumental scale building, as you are to say, wow, this is the exact place where the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself delivered the I Have a Dream speech, which is celebrated every year uh, around this time uh, to the delight and glee of uh, grade school teachers everywhere uh, and is established as an absolute uh, powerful tale, morality tale of who we are as a society. Uh, this was a point of pivoting from one condition to the next. And the Lincoln Memorial, as much as it has to do with Lincoln, uh, it, he, Lincoln now shares uh, meaning uh, in this, embedded in this building with King. And uh, so those are the four ways. Explication, exemplification, metaphor, and the events of history. Uh, and then things go on to say, hey, wow, this is that building I saw on the $5 bill, to the extent that we still use these things. Uh, must be important. Uh, and so the meaning of architecture um, also becomes an instrument for deploying uh, larger meanings and reproducing those meanings throughout society. And so buildings are not just passive. Uh, here we go. This is something that's going to play a role uh, throughout the semester, um, uh, not just in the first week, but buildings can be passive reflections of cultural meanings, or they can be deployed as active instruments for the transformation of cultural meanings. And here's an example of the deployment of architecture in, as an instrument for the active renegotiation of cultural meanings here in the United States. And so what did I say those were again? These are out of order, but left to right, the events of history, uh, exemplification, <clears throat> metaphor, and explication. It's written on the walls. Now to see how this works, uh, just look at the World Trade Center when it was first built. It was a highly destructive uh, transformation of Lower Manhattan. Uh, then it became something... Uh, that we just took for granted as the memory of what had been there previously faded into the distance. And then, of course, the events of history conspired to take what we used to think of as a, a really bad piece of architecture, but big, uh, turned it into something completely different. Um, and those understandings and those meanings are crucial to any act of design uh, following uh, subsequent act of design, where this uh, 
takes the exact footprint of those buildings. So the urban condition becomes the fundamental factual reality of the new design. Uh, the understanding of the role in history, the events of history, um, here, tiny fragment in the lower right corner, you see explication, you see exemplification. Wow, that is a deep hole. Uh, it's like the uh, painful place in my heart uh, where things go to vanish and die. Um, uh, it's a metaphor uh, in many ways, uh, and it's also very clearly the ongoing replication of events in history every morning on September 11th from now until the end of time. Uh, the TV cameras will show up, and this will become the backdrop for uh, the morning news and further rituals of commemoration. Okay, that's the introduction. We cut here and we go directly to week number one, uh, the city as cosmos, the role of form, uh, the direct giving of form, the deliberate design of formal arrangements uh, in order to construct meaning. Um, Kevin Lynch, uh, you know who he is, the author of The Image of the City, the godfather of this course. He uh, said there are three normative models uh, for city formation. The city as cosmos, the city as a machine, and the city as an organism. These are metaphors for how cities are formed and operate, and we will be going through each of these three in the three first weeks of the semester. Week one, City as Cosmos. Uh, this uh, is an example of a Chinese tradition of uh, architectural and urban formation. You see the representation of a classical Chinese house, uh, the villa, the courtyard, uh, and the same cosmological exemplification of religious meanings are expanded in scale to the, to the scale of larger complexes, uh, palace complexes, urban complexes, the establishment of whole towns and cities, all follow this cosmological uh, model where the house and urban form acts as a model for the larger cosmological arrangements uh, that are believed to guide the formation of the heavens and earth. Uh, so the Chinese tradition, religious tradition, uh, established um, these uh, forms that were replicated in houses and towns throughout uh, China and anywhere China had its influence. Um, uh, I refer to the name China, we think of it as the name of this nation state. It's important to understand that nation states are a very recent, very modern uh, invention. Uh, prior to the hardened boundaries of nation states or the myth of hardened boundaries of nation states, there were hardened boundaries and identities of city states. And so wherever the city state, uh, the current capital of the Han uh, ethnic culture of the Chinese people. Uh, wherever they had influence, uh, so too went this model of uh, religious, architectural, formal, spatial uh, arrangements. And so you have the classic Chinese courtyard house uh, in plan, in section. Uh, these spatial arrangements uh, were an instrument for constantly reinforcing the meanings of Confucian uh, belief system, uh, the sanctity of uh, the family, the hierarchies of uh, age uh, and rulers, uh, all of these relationships, too many for us to go into in the context of this course, but simply suffice it for the purposes of this topic, uh, what's important to remember is that the, there was no separation between architecture and religion. Uh, between religion and government, between power and economics. It was all one single unified integrated system. Uh, it is only very recently and in limited context that we have the separation of church and state, 
that we have a division between political power of governance and the power, the financial power of uh, wealth. Uh, this is a new condition that the family is not integral with religion um, and the worship of ancestors. These separations in many ways are brand new modern inventions and a very strange situation in the larger context of human reality. Uh, and some would say it's uh, also unlikely and a bit uh, perverse to uh, have these separations. Um, in many ways, they have a way. The separations have a way of uh, of dissolving, and 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 they join back together. In, in many ways, whether we acknowledge it or not. Um, if you've been to the Peabody Essex Museum, you've experienced uh, one manifestation of Chinese uh, home structure that resonate and reproduce with absolute uh, fidelity these structures of the belief system. Um, right down to the details and the meanings of every detail in the, in the house. Uh, and we can trace this through the engravings of early uh, systems, and we see it still engraved in the surface of the planet. Um, one of our favorite examples uh, of everyone to look at for this topic of the city as cosmos is the Forbidden City at the heart of Beijing, uh, the axial formation, uh, the north-south axis, uh, it's all there available to uh, develop in these analytical uh, drawings. I'm calling them drawings. It's really um, transparent overlays on top of uh, uh, aerial photography. Uh, and different segments, uh, different portions of the palace, either at the urban scale. Now we get down to the scale of the Forbidden City. Uh, here's uh, a similar formation in Kyoto, Japan, where the Chinese uh, system had a very powerful influence. In many ways, uh, Japanese urban structures are very directly uh, coming out of the exact same tradition as China with local manipulations. Here's a segment of the Forbidden City. So we see how these patterns are replicated at ever smaller scales, almost like a fractal ge geometric system. Uh, and so uh, are there other systems other than the Chinese Confucian uh, system, belief system manifesting uh, in architectural urban form? Of course, here is the Buddhist stupa uh, in various manifestations uh, from a simple singular domed um, building to the larger temple complex uh, of Borobudur in Java, uh, Indonesia, and at the bottom uh, uh, also, um, Indonesia, I'm not actually, I think I'm just seeing that for the first time. I believe that's a mislabeling. Um, that's actually in, in Thailand or Burma, one of the, the others, but it's not in Indonesia. Um, and uh, so here we are in Indonesia, Borobudur, the largest Buddhist temple in the world. It is a mandala. Uh, mandala is a geometric symbol system. Uh, that is used uh, graphically as part of the understanding of the operation of uh, life, the world, human relationships, uh, flows of energy, etc. And it is considered a sacred geometry that is used in rituals, uh, 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 both Hindu and Buddhist, uh, but also considered by uh, some traditions the proper mode of formation of buildings and complexes and cities, um, uh, such as Angkor Wat in Cambodia, uh, actually developed quite late. It's not prehistoric. It's not ancient. It was built around the same time as uh, some of the Western monuments you may have studied uh, in the history of architecture, um, starting uh, Byzantium, uh, Hagia Sophia, uh, Actually, it's quite contemporary with those uh, buildings and continued developing through the period of the Gothic cathedrals and even the Renaissance. Uh, but here it's labeled 900 AD, um, and here it's analyzed. Uh, water was a very important part of this formation. And so it's not just um, about religious symbolism, but also uh, completely integrated with uh, sustaining life forces. Uh, the Hindu uh, system um, 
starting in South Asia, a place we now call India. Uh, the Hindu religious uh, system manifested as a specific architecture of biaxial symmetries, always the inclusion of some imperfections so as not to insult God, but uh, also a vertical axis referred. And so it's a very strict uh, symbol system of architectural form uh, intended to create a microcosmic model of the universe uh, and the ordering system of the universe. Uh, Kevin Lynch talked about this, uh, and his favorite example was the temple city of Madurai, India, where the temple complex at the center performs uh, very important religious functions throughout uh, the centuries up to the present day, where rituals are still enacted uh, to renew the relationships and the balance and harmony between heaven and earth. And the city that has grown up around this temple complex continues to follow certain rules of uh, religious uh, constructs of uh, urban form and architectural form. Uh, and here we see a mandala uh, spread with um, the sprinkling of chalk uh, dust or drawn with chalk uh, for good luck at the portals of the houses. Uh, so the mandala still plays an important role to the present uh, in the uh, cycle of rituals to uh, maintain good fortune flowing uh, between heaven and earth. Some of these patterns are, are quite beautiful and elaborate. Uh, here's uh, the central complex um, of Madurai with courtyards, temples, uh, walls, and gateways that start to become the, uh, the ordering structure of not just the urban form, but also the religious practices and certain understandings of daily life. And here's, uh, you can start to see patterns that flow out from the central temple complex um, uh, in these uh, concentric circles, not quite circles, but concentric patterns that are very mandala-like uh, in the formation of the city. And uh, it's not just a passive structure of the city. Uh, the structure of the city plays a central role in the uh, ongoing ritual recognition of Hindu practices and understandings and beliefs and reproducing them for the young uh, and making it stay alive. So the architecture and urban form plays a central role in the maintenance of certain attitudes towards the world. Which brings us uh, to the city of Jakarta, Indonesia, where uh, we see this modern uh, column uh, at the center, this national monument uh, modeled after the Washington Monument. Um, and the, why do we look at these, uh, these examples from other parts of the world? What do they have to do with us? Well, it turns out that if you look at uh, our, if we look at ourselves in the mirror, we are so used to seeing what we see that we can't really see it uh, anymore. Uh, certain things we don't notice. Um, uh, people tell me I have gray in my beard, but I don't see it. I look in the mirror, I see uh, the same person I've always seen. Uh, similarly, we look at uh, our own society, and we're different from the rest of the world. We're not corrupt. We're not. We have democracy. We have all kinds of things, and you know we don't really see it with uh, neutrality. So it's sometimes useful to look at unfamiliar situations to recognize certain phenomena that we would be the last ones to see or admit uh, in looking uh, more locally uh, at our our own cities. And so, and also, some other some of these places offer uh, quite dramatic, uh, some would say even bizarre, uh, uh, aberrations of human behavior and the role of cities in those aberrations uh, that offer quite dramatic demonstrations of what is possible. And once you see it someplace else, you become more sensitized, and you're more likely to recognize some of these things happening. Uh, in more familiar circumstances. So it's quite useful to look at a place that none of us have ever thought of before, much less been, um, 
how many people have been to Jakarta? No one. So uh, let's look at Jakarta. Uh, and we see something familiar. We see almost a, a replica of the Washington Monument that they built in, uh, right after independence in 1949. Because like the United States, nations need to have a national monument. And so they built their own national monument. And so here it is. It was designed by an architect who happened to also be uh, the leader of the revolution and the first president of Indonesia, uh, a man by the name of Sukarno. He was one of, uh, among the first graduates of the Bandung Institute of Technology, modeled, as is Wentworth, uh, on the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology to give a very similar education to young professionals uh, including architects. Um, Sukarno was a modern architect and he built modern buildings all over his capital city of Jakarta when he became president. Uh, to, if you've seen the movie uh, Year of Living Dangerously, uh, he did this uh, by neglecting the basic needs of the rest of the nation um, quite dramatically. But here he was, a young modern architect, uh, designing buildings uh, in the modern idiom for uh, Indonesia, uh, but it was simultaneously embedded with the symbolism of the Hindu Javanese world order. Uh, the Hindu symbols of the Linga and Yoni uh, strike at the very heart of the essence of life, the male and female genitalia. Uh, the Linga is the tower, the Yoni is the base, and, um, and so Hinduism is very much implicated throughout uh, his constructions, even though they look like modern buildings. Um, so uh, Indonesia uh, is a spread out archipelago down here, and I'm sorry my pointer is not working. Um, look it up. But these red places are zones of very high population density. Uh, and it kind of tells you, as uh, the earlier slide in the lecture in class showed, that the planet is uh, very unevenly populated. Uh, there are high concentrations of population in very localized situations. Northern India, uh, Tokyo, uh, the south and east coasts of China, and then at the bottom, uh, an island about the size of the state of California, one of the highest population densities in the world, Java, the island of Java, which is the dominant uh, location of the country of Indonesia. Oh, there's Indonesia, uh, which includes Sumatra, Borneo, Sel the Celebes, now called Sulawesi. Uh, there's Jakarta, just below the Java Sea, tiny little speck called Bali, you may have heard of. Uh, Irian Jaya is also part of Indonesia, um, not very clearly labeled on this map, but this gives you a sense of context. Um, very rich, fertile agricultural lands uh, made so by the volcanoes that uh, renew the fertility through constant uh, volcanic activity. Uh, the island of Java, you see the line of volcanoes across the top, resulted in very, very rich agricultural production, which supported a very high population. Uh, and the very early specialization uh, and rise of priests and kings. And it brings us to uh, the royal city of Surakarta, there in the middle uh, of that island, um, next, uh, nestled between some volcanoes. Uh, this photo could have been taken a uh, hundred years ago or hundreds of years ago if there were cameras to do such things, but it was actually taken quite recently. And here we see the linga on the left and the yoni on the right, um, exemplified in these uh, symbols uh, that are paraded through the streets uh, of the palace and the city uh, in um, three times a year as part of... Uh, ironically, of an Islamic celebration. And so you see Hinduism, Islam, all melding together along with Buddhism and animism um, in these urban formations. So uh, stepping back, um, it might be interesting to uh, talk about uh, how we got here. 
In architecture school, I was looking at Salk Institute by Lou Kahn in La Jolla, California, specifically this very radical, innovative structural system of the Virendale trusses uh, here in this worm's eye view um, that uh, I spent hundreds of hours working on, uh, drawing by, by hand. Uh, these sections uh, showing how those Virendale trusses made these uh, flexible spaces of the laboratories uh, and in these sections in quite interesting relationship up some stairs to offices for the researchers uh, and then there's some empty space between and I didn't really get it but the most interesting thing about this building is not the Virendale structural system it's not the uh, sectional splitting uh, between the offices and the laboratories. It is that empty space uh, between the buildings that is the most powerful, uh, charged, uh, uh, extremely uh, interesting architectural experience uh, the, of this water slot cut uh, pointing towards the horizon line of the Pacific Ocean. And it was a watershed moment in, in understanding that it's not just the things, the objects of architecture that are a source of power, although they are. Uh, it's also the space between. It's the spaces that are created. It's the spaces that are framed by this very powerful formal arrangement of the laboratory buildings. And so that set me off uh, to learn Italian and prepare to do research in the city of Rome where this rich uh, mosaic of interior and exterior public space shown here in the famous um, 17, I uh, can't remember the exact date, let's call it 1770, um, Noli map uh, of Rome, uh, which is basically a figure ground drawing with a little something extra. It also includes the architectural uh, spaces of the churches and other public spaces of Rome. A very powerful starting point uh, for Weldon Priest's experiments in, uh, in depicting and analyzing urban space as architecture. Um, a friend, uh, I was getting ready to go to Rome when a friend sent me this photo and uh, and told some stories and I said forget about Rome I'm going to Java um, showed up uh, and was surprised to find a palace and not just a palace but a royal family uh, charged with the maintenance of the rituals surrounding the palace and the palace like the Manakshi temple at the core of the city of Madurai the palace itself is an instrument of maintaining the balance between heaven and earth. And here's the Hindu Javanese cosmological model of ring, oceans, and continents um, in the giant sea of endless water uh, uh, with a few islands. Um, here's another depiction of the Hindu Javanese um, model, cosmological model. This is the diagram for the palace complex of uh, the Kraton Surakarta uh, uh, at the center of the city of Solo, Java. And much of this is written about in the reading, so I'm going to uh, move quickly through the illustrations just so you have a clear sense of what this looks like. Uh, here the north-south axis runs uh, left and right with north to the right and uh, the palace is organized um, along that north-south axis uh, in this way. Uh, this is the names, the forms, the gates, the, the courtyards. Every courtyard is an ocean. Every walled precinct is a uh, continent and the gates that lead from one to the next um, are all modeled and named uh, according to their correlation to the Hindu Javanese cosmological model. Uh, and in the, at each gate, uh, there are mirrors to the right and left uh, where you examine your outer and inner state to make sure you are sufficiently prepared, uh, pure, 
in appearance and pure in thought uh, so that you are qualified to enter into the next level, uh, moving from less sacred outside the palace to ever greater degrees of sacredness towards the center of the palace uh, uh, where you take off your shoes uh, and you, um, you behave differently. You may even use a different language level. Uh, you speak in a fancier uh, language of high Javanese, uh, whereas outside the palace you might be joking around in very coarse low Javanese. Um, uh, there's more about this in the reading. Here's a depiction of that arrangement. Uh, here's a sacred ritual where the canon that shall not be seen by anyone but the priest who cleans it uh, three times a year and the king himself. Um, and the washing of the building that houses the canon and the washing of the pavilion that houses the building that houses the canon and uh, the scrubbing and the sweeping away of the water, squeegeeing the way the water from the canon to the building, to the pavilion and out to the awaiting throngs of usually women uh, competing, pushing, and clawing each other to collect that water in plastic bottles uh, down to the last drop uh, because when their kids get sick, they mix some of that water in with the tea. When their crops fail, they mix it and they pour it into the rice fields in order to capture that power. So this is not just an empty uh, gesture um, like the Memorial Day Parade uh, that we do it because we're in the habit of doing it it still has a great deal of meaning for these people. Here's another one. This are photos of the, uh, the Javanese New Year ceremony where these people, this could have been taken hundreds of years ago or a hundred years ago, but it wasn't. It was a few years ago. Uh, these people are volunteers, servants of the king. They walk in from the villages uh, wearing the Samir uh, ribbon, the gold and red which is a symbol to the Queen of the South Sea, that they are friends of the family and please do not um, cripple them or cause disease. They are here in peace to serve the king and that's what that ribbon means. They, um, they come in during the day and they sit and they wait until darkness. Villagers from a 50 kilometer radius walk in uh, to line the streets awaiting for the, um, the procession uh, that uh, may or may not get started shortly after dark. Um, it depends. When does the king emerge from his inner sanctum uh, carrying previously selected sacred items uh, in, uh, designed to stave off hardship and correct un imbalances of the previous year? And so these things are paraded behind the white buffalo. When the white buffalo stop, everybody stops. And when they trot uh, ahead, everybody runs after them. And the people on the sides of the street, when the animals uh, defecate, uh, compete, oh, you can read about it. Um, and so these rituals are renewed constantly uh, and uh, throughout the ages. This is not just some cute little tourist attraction it actually means something to the people who participate, the tens of thousands of people who participate. Uh, as comical as it appears uh, with these pith helmets and uh, swords and medals and bizarre uh, hodgepodge of the Baroque architectural style from the Dutch architect who helped the king rebuild the palace, the Middle Eastern fez, the brass band, the uh, Dutch uh, tuxedo tails coat where the tails were snipped off to allow the sword to be inserted, the Dutch carriage which has been um, christened a sacred Javanese uh, instrument of power and used to restore the balance. Uh, these things are still all going on, the ribbons, uh, the ceremonies, the king is still there, the parades of the Linga and Yoni. So there's a mixture of uh, the Queen of the South Sea animistic tradition that predates the Hindu uh, influence from India. Uh, there's the Linga Yoni from the Hindu influence. There's the structure of the palace itself from the Hindu influence. There's the Buddhist influence. Uh, it's very mandala-like. 
there is Islamic. Uh, this is actually a ceremony uh, commemorating the ascension of uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, because ostensibly all of these people are Muslim. There are the influences of European uh, royalty and modernism. Uh, there's globalization ongoing. All of these things uh, continue to mix together in this setting. But at the same time, these uh, traditions that have been going on for hundreds of years continue to go on, uh, such as the scramble for the, the components of the linga and yoni because they are so powerful. Even that little rice cake uh, is going to help. Um, when uh, the palace uh, caught the attention, the decay of the palace caught the attention of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, uh, we worked on restoring the palace under the guidance of this sacred priest, who is also a carpenter architect, uh, and the understandings of the different sections of the palace proved a crucial role. The uh, ritual practices around um, uh, all of the sacred renewal of the palace had to be followed, even as we uh, used scientific modern techniques for documentation and understanding uh, of everything uh, through all our work. Um, there's much more of this written down uh, in the chapter, and uh, here's an example of the kind of analytical uh, drawing that we do on places like this. Uh, the king uh, became the reference point uh, in the end of the reading. Uh, we talked about how uh, even though the scientific evidence indicated that back in 1840, the right color for this pavilion was blue, we presented that evidence to the king and we said, we suggest blue, but it's really up to you because uh, the king, uh, the 10th king back in 1842 is dead and gone. Uh, you're the king now, you're the source of authority, you are the source of sacred meaning. Uh, if you want it to be purple or pink, we'll, we'll do whatever you say. And so that's how we, we worked. Um, doing things by hand, revival of the crafts, following all the rituals, uh, transforming the decay into something much better. Um, throughout, um, a very interesting process of hand painting, following all the old rituals, whether... So we go from this to this, even using Bondo uh, auto body putty, which is absolutely ridiculous, uh, unacceptable practice anywhere else in the world. But it turns out that the humidity is so stable, up around 97% in Java, that uh, the expansion contraction of the wood uh, is minimal, so you can actually get away with it, and that turns out to be the sacred tradition of this palace is Bondo auto buddy paste um, for these such such matters. So there's still a king. Um, my king died. Uh, there was a struggle for succession. Uh, this guy lost. Um, the guy who's in uh, is continuing the traditions. Uh, and in the context of modern Indonesian life, uh, filled with automobiles. Um, and so uh, the reading goes into this uh, a bit, uh, and it claims, uh, makes some very interesting claims that globalization just might not be uh, a new thing, and it just might not be uh, the, the death of all things um, unfamiliar. Uh, the homogenization of the planet is definitely happening but it will never be a complete process. It will always be incomplete because of the uh, the cultural strategies uh, that are embedded in places like Java. Um, and so uh, even uh, in, uh, we can think of it like this, even in modern cities uh, with modern architecture, there are still... Uh, very deeply embedded meanings uh, that carry over a continuous, unbroken tradition from the past.